Thank you so much, Liz, uh, for being with us on the podcast today. I couldn't have imagined a list of paradigm shifting books and not have multipliers be included on that list. So really, really appreciate you taking some time out uh, to, to, to be on the podcast today. Well, you know, see, I'm, I'm just glad to have made your list. There's a lot of lists of, you know, people's books, but like, you know, books that have sort of enduring and are principle based, like it's really an honor to be on that list. Well, that, that, that means a lot. And that is one of the things about, about this podcast that we really like to focus on is talking about both the principles and the paradigms behind your book, which, which we'll get into. But I'm, I'm curious, before we, before we jump into some of the more specifics, I'd like to talk maybe a little bit about the origin of, of the book. So in, in, the book you're, uh, in the book itself, you talk a little bit about your time at Oracle. You were there for 17 years. Um, you were the vice president of global talent development and strategy. And last I checked, there was like over 130,000 employees at Oracle, which is just, wow, just, which is massive. There's a lot of employees. And then you talked a little bit about your post Oracle therapy, how you like had to come down from this, you know, fast paced, high speed era to things were a little bit more calm. And then it sounded like you had this question kind of burning inside you about, you know, how do some leaders create intelligence while others diminish it. And then I, I was curious, did you go, did you set out to write a book or did you just set out to do research? And then as you did research, you said, you know what, this needs to be a book. I'm, I'm just curious, kind of hear the background of that. Well, you know, I, I'm someone who very much stumbled, fell into being an author. I was never like a little girl who said, I want to write a book when I grow up. That was like, the last thing on my mind, I ended up writing a book because I had something to say. And the reason why I had something to say is I had done all this research. And the reason why I did this research is I really had these nagging questions. And, and it was in many ways part of my post-Oracle therapy. That was a really intense place to work. And I left not just like with all of this energy that I had to figure out what to do with, but I left with a few observations and, and questions and things that concerned me. And I guess I was just, I was curious about this. And I think the first came from, you know, really joining Oracle when it was very young, it was in this, it was a small company. Nobody knew what it was. I joined Oracle out of business school and people like Oracle, well, what's that? Like, do they make toothpaste or toothbrushes like Oral B or, and it was this young Maverick software company and they had a really interesting hiring strategy in that they targeted 17 schools and these were the top schools in the nation, um, all with top CS programs. So, you know, computer science, electrical engineering, and they were just gobbling up talent and they looked for this particular profile and they were looking for like uber smart, like freaky achievement orientation. Like I cannot tell you how many Olympians there were just floating around the company. Oh, this person had a gold medal in like the bobsled or something. So these really driven people. And then the third thing they looked for was nice. And, you know, they occasionally compromised on nice when they hired people, but they rarely compromised on these two. And they, they hired just from these 17 schools. And I did not, and you know, you can imagine what schools these are. I did not go to one of those schools, but somehow I got like, I got into the company as a new college graduate. And because of that, and I think because I didn't go to one of those 17 schools, I was really in awe of all of these uber smart hyper achievement oriented, mostly nice people. And I just was fascinated. Like, wow. And I never, I never got this um, imposter syndrome thing. Like, oh, I don't deserve to be here. That might've been the case, but I never felt that way. I just felt lucky. Like, wow, look at these really smart people that I get to work with. Like I have the coolest job 
in the whole world. Every day, I feel like I'm back in college and just surrounded by all these really put together smart people. And I started noticing like how people's intelligence showed up. And, you know, so add to that, that I'm constantly watching like all of these really smart people and admiring their intelligence. And then the company's growing really rapidly. I get thrown into management and I've been at the company a year. I'm a year out of business school and I, I'm now told, okay, you're now managing the training department, which is really training for this. I guess we were probably about five or 6,000 employees at the time. And I just got put in charge of that for the world. And I had no idea what I was doing. And I think when you bring those two things together, there was a couple things I noticed, which is one, all these really, really smart people I admired that some of them, when they got put into management jobs, their intelligence really sucked the life out of the people they led. I'm like, wow, they're smart, but no one else gets to be smart. Like, that's not right. And then I saw other really, really smart people, but yet people were at their best around them. And then I also looked at it from the employee experience and and then I'm like, man, all these really smart people I feel lucky to work with, I was watching them. Let's pick Let's pick someone. Let's let's have him call. His name is Stephen. Just I would watch Stephen. I'm like, Stephen's brilliant. And then I would be in a meeting with him and he would absolutely fall apart in this meeting and, you know, couldn't articulate his thoughts and was like not able to to um, like take ownership of stuff. I'm like, that's not the Stephen I know. But then I would see the same person in a different meeting and I would see a totally different version of them. And I'm like, what is going on here? And then I started to realize this is really, this is a function of the leader. And, and, you know, I'm in this high growth organization and they're obsessing over hiring all these really, really smart people. They bring them all in the door. We're training them and we're making this huge investment in this talent. And then I'm watching a lot of these people um, underutilized and, you know, this phrase that, that your grandfather, I don't know if he coined, but he used was that people can end up overworked and underutilized. I'm like, why would you work so hard to hire all these smart people and then underutilize them? Like, you don't need to go hire more people. You've got really smart people right here. But the manager is like somehow underappreciating and underutilizing this intelligence that they work so hard to create. And it was really those two observations. And I kept seeing this play out over and over. And it wasn't until I left Oracle and started coaching other leaders that I could see, oh, this isn't an Oracle thing. This is an everywhere thing. And, you know, I I just began to see that sometimes really, really smart people don't make the best managers. And, and I think there's a little bit of my own personal background that helps see this and, and helps see, I think, this other dynamic, which is like some of this diminishing that was, that was going on wasn't coming from bad managers. It was coming from actually really good people who had no idea that they were shutting down the intelligence of others. And I think my own upbringing kind of gave me this lens or the skill set that helped me see that people's intention and their impact can be really, really um, far off. That sometimes people who are having a diminishing impact on others are doing it with just the best of intentions. Yeah, that's, that's, that is, that is fascinating to kind of hear that, the, the background. So, so in your research, um, you, you, basically come to the, came to this conclusion of what you call the multiplier effect, which I love how you term it. it it's a spectrum, right? There's on the, the, the two extremes. On the one side, you've got the multipliers, and on the other side, you've got the diminishers. Um, so leaders kind of fall on this spectrum. What, what is, I guess, what's a, bro- a broad, high-level overview of what a multiplier is versus a diminisher. I think some of it's relatively self-explanatory, but, but I love the way that you 
kind of articulate um, the, the differences between a multiplier and a diminisher? Well, well, simply put, you know, a multiplier is a leader who uses his or her intelligence. And, you know, by that, I mean, their know-how, their skills, their insights, their creativity, their talent, if you will. They use their own intelligence in a way that amplifies the intelligence of others. They're leaders who are smart, but people around them are smart. They're at their best. And they're, they're amplifiers of the intelligence and capability of the team. Essentially, they're leaders who are using their own intelligence as a tool, not a weapon. Like a tool to innovate, uh, a tool to grow an organization, um, a, a tool that causes other people to engage in things and take ownership and get it done and deliver great results. They multiply the intelligence of the team. Whereas the diminisher is someone who uses their own intelligence in a way that causes other people to hold back. And, and this comes in really a couple varieties. Like one is leaders who are doing it almost on purpose. Like their need to be the smartest person in the room, like is a wet blanket on, on the ideas of others. Like they're big, they're loud, they're know-it-alls, you know, they're micromanagers. They're very overtly shutting down people around them. Like people feel compelled to step back around them. Others have the same diminishing effect, but it's, um, it, it, it comes from a little different place. It's not like they're overtly shutting people down. It's that people tend to shut down around them often just because they, they're capable. Like, for example, I, um, I had this boss when I was at Oracle, so my last job, who was just brilliant at presenting to customers, listening to objections, overcoming that. And he and I would often go into our customer visit center and we would be giving a presentation. We, you know, together ran the education business for Oracle. And I would just listen to him present and I thought he was so good at it that I, you know, like, okay, I could do part of that, but he was better at it than me. So I just let him do that. And I wasn't bad at it. I was a B, he was an A. Maybe even a, I was a B plus, he was an A minus. But I just deferred to him and I let him do all that. And I would end up taking this backseat role. And in some ways, like my capability is going down because I'm just not needed in that case. It was actually nothing he did. It was all my own doing, which is, oh, he's got it. I'll step back. And a lot of times people end up diminished, not because someone is pushing them down. It's simply because they feel they're not needed. Oh, the boss has got this. You know what? She'll solve this problem. Oh, you know, he'll handle it. And we end up deferring to them. They grow in capability, but we end up languishing around them. Yeah, it's it's an amazing and and, and again, why I say it's 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 a paradigm shifting way to think about to think about leadership for me um, is this idea that uh, of being a multiplier where you're multiplying the effect. And actually, something I wanted to ask you about. So, as I was reflecting on this, um, I kind of went back to uh, some of the stuff my grandpa talks about with. Uh, um, seven habits and habit six, habit six being synergy. And the way that, you know, you, you hear a definition of synergy is it's, uh, the, the, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And, and for the first time, cause I, I read multipliers years ago, um, six or seven years ago. And then I read it again in, in preparation for us talking. And it just kind of struck me that multipliers is, it's almost like the execution of habit six of, of synergy of this. I think the, the principle behind it is the creative cooperation where you're able to produce something and, and come up with something that's, that's, that's greater than just, you know, it's not just a one plus one equals two. It's one plus one can, can equal a lot more. And I feel like that maybe ties into some of the data that you've gotten on, you know, what, what, 
what multipliers are able to do with their people. I mean, am I, am I off base on that? Or is that, have, have you thought about it in terms of, you know, this is, this is what synergy is. I know synergy can be like a buzzword sometimes, but. Right. It means everything it, and nothing, but I do think, I do think there is synergy going on. Now I have to say when I did the research, I was really looking at a one-to-one relationship. Let's say I work for you. You're the boss. You're either a diminisher or a multiplier or somewhere in between. And I was really looking at what is that boss's effect on the person that works for them, in this case, on me. And, and in that case, there is this multiplier effect, which is people report working for these diminishing leaders that they got less than half of their available intelligence. Like people said, I could have given so much more. I wanted to give so much more, but like there was this, in some ways, a almost like a glass wall or a glass ceiling of like, I wasn't able to contribute to my fullest. Whereas people say working for these multipliers, like they got everything that I had, you know, on a scale of zero to hundred, it was a hundred percent. Or as I did this research, there was a bunch of people who were like, okay, hundred percent. And I went back and I looked at the data. I was tabulating all the data And there were so many people who said on a scale of zero to 100, they got 110% of my capability. So I I was, you can imagine, not entirely inspired by this. I was annoyed by it because I'm like, you know, 100 is all, all of your know-how and insight and capability. And I was not wanting to know how hard people were working. And I really didn't want people to say, oh, man, I gave it the college try. I left it all in the field, 150%. How much of your brain were they getting access to? And so I truncated all of that at 100, thinking I had, you know, done the logical thing. And it wasn't until a colleague looked at that and said, well, why did you do that? I'm like, oh, my goodness, we're going to go through basic math here, which is, you know, on a scale of 0 to 100, 100 is all. And he said, I think there's, there's a message in this. And I went back and I looked at my notes, I contacted some of the people who'd given me these percentages over a hundred. And the story was so consistent. They said two things. One is this leader got things for me. I didn't know I had, which sounds good, but I'm like, Oh, I'm not convinced that's more than a hundred. Like, because you had it, it just, you didn't know you had it, but you, you had it. And then the other thing people said was, I grew so much working for this person that um, the scale changed. It's like we get, like our stature grows around them intellectually that there's this multiplier kind of effect because people are not only giving all they have, people are growing. Their capability is, is multiplying. So there's, there's that kind of multiplication going on. But then when you look at what this looks like collectively, like what happens on a team when somebody feels like they have both, you know, it's, it's funny, um, Stephen, it took me years after having written this book before I really understood the book. And I think that's probably the case with a lot of authors. And it wasn't until years later that I'm like, oh, man, I've wasted a lot of words because I can boil this book down to, to two words and uh, let's call it two and a half words is safety and stretch. Like what these leaders do is they create an environment where people feel safe. So there's the psychological safety that, you know, um, Dr. Amy Edmondson writes about, but it's also an intellectual safety. It's like, man, I feel like I can, share a crazy idea with you and not be penalized for this. I feel like I can take a risk and, and not um, get fired or be shamed for that. Like people feel comfortable around these leaders, but then they create stretch. So a lot of people, a lot of leaders um, fall short of this kind of multiplier status because you know, they're good people, they love you up, they treat you well, you know, the work environment's got ping pong tables and free food or whatever it is. Like, it's a great place to work, but they haven't asked you to stretch. I mean, think about it. Like, we've all had experience working for a leader who was like all safety, but no stretch. 
it's diminishing actually. But we've also probably all worked for a leader who was all stretch and no safety. And that's definitely diminishing. Like we're afraid to try. So <clears throat> what they do is they create this condition where people feel comfortable, but they also feel compelled. Like, okay, you know, they give me some space to think. Now I need to step up and perform. So let's say, you know, you as the leader have created that environment. I feel safe to speak up. Uh, you know, I feel appreciated. I'm given hard things to do. You're getting 100% of my capability and this growth dividends. I'm learning and contributing more. Now, let's say I'm on a team and there's 10 of us and we all feel that sense of safety and stretch. Like now you create an environment where synergy can happen. It's like, okay, now you've got lots of people contributing at their fullest and being challenged and then challenging each other and building on each other's work. Ah, that's how that works. So I do think it's, it is synergistic in this way. No, that's, that's so, so insightful. I appreciate you going down that path. Cause that's, that's, I was kind of thinking like long-term, but that's interesting that, so the data originally, when you studied it, it was just the, um, the leader to the individual was kind of the initial um, data you're looking at. Interesting. I wanted to talk about some of the surprising findings that you felt um, that you found from, you know, the multipliers. And I think it ties into some, some of what you said last time. So you mentioned three in the book that the first one was that they're hard edged, which I, which I loved. And it, I think it has to do with what you're saying about stretch is that I think, you know, I, I remember when I first saw the book multipliers, my initial impression was like, without reading anything, it's like, Oh, multipliers, like, you know, a, a great boss that pats you on the back has a great relationship with you, you know, that kind of soft stuff. But that was surprising to me too. It's like, no, that's, that's not what a multiplier is. Like they are hard edged results driven people and they demand those results. So that was the first surprising one. The second one you said as well was that they don't play small. And then you mentioned a story about magic Johnson. That was awesome. And then the other one you mentioned is that they have a great sense of humor so out of those, kind of out of those three, what were, I mean, you said they were all surprising, but which one was kind of the most surprising? Well, I. Or you can talk about all three if you want, but. <laughs> well, yeah, I, well the, okay, let's start with the sense of humor. That was completely personal in nature. So I'm coming up with, it, it wasn't surprising I guess it was surprising that it was true, but I think I knew it at one level. And I'm putting the survey together for this, and I'm going to go collect a bunch of data. And at the last minute, I toss onto the survey. You know, I'm trying to keep the survey really as short as I possibly can to get, but get good data. I toss on there, has a sense of humor. And one of my colleagues was like, what did you do that for? I'm like, it's a little bit personal, but it's it's part of my like lifelong attempt to vindicate myself for having been voted class clown of my high school graduating class. And I mean, I completely deserved the, the, the distinction because I was always goofing off, always a smart aleck, you know, always like teachers kind of hated me and loved me. You know, it was just a question of which was more at, at the time. And I just had this like sense that, you know what? I think there's something to do with humor in here. And maybe it's because I like to work with fun people. I like to work with funny people. I like to work with people who can laugh at themselves. And these diminishers just seemed so serious to me. Like the ones that I could kind of point to. And it totally, I tossed it on the, the survey and it turned out that it is the item. It's not the most correlated with multipliers. There's a couple items that are more correlated. It's the most negatively correlated with diminishers meaning they're not funny. Like they're like a little too self-absorbed, taking things very seriously. But we found that these multiplier leaders have this ability to laugh at themselves. Now they're not comedians. They're not necessarily people who you would think of as a class clown, but they're people who take a light approach to work. Like they have a hard edge, but they can laugh at themselves like, oh man, I can't believe that. I just blew that. Or, you know, just they have an appreciation for life's foibles. So it's, 
it's part of creating this light environment. I, I actually have this deep belief. Again, this is all like my personal vendetta to like prove to my mother that really like <laughs> that there was some value to her cut up daughter. Um, Cause I think she was, my mother is so serious and so authentic, beautifully like sincere. And I think she didn't know what to do with the smart aleck daughter that she had. But um, like, I really believe that environments that are light are the environments we need, like gravitas requires levity. Like the more that we can like be lighthearted about the things that don't really matter, it just kind of clears a way for us to deal with the issues that really do matter. But anyway, so that was one that I think in some ways is surprising, but there was a part of me that um, like wasn't surprised by that. And I think the biggest surprise of all was just how much of the diminishing is accidental. And, you know, it, it began, I began to sort of like sense this, sniff this out when I was doing the research. Some of my, you know, colleagues, some of my Oracle friends like, hey, Liz, what you doing? Oh, I'm writing a book. You know, everyone thinks, oh, Liz is writing some midlife crisis kind of book. Like, oh, she's doing her post Oracle book. She's going to get done with that. And then she's going to go get a real job. And, and I would tell them, like, what are you, you know, studying? What are you writing about? And I would tell them, and they're like, oh, wow, that's great, because I am such a multiplier. And it was interesting. I started my research here in Silicon Valley, and there was like, oh, I don't know, about a half a dozen companies that I did all my initial research in. And so when people are naming their diminisher and their multiplier that they're going to tell me about, and then I'm building a behavioral profile about, I know a lot of these names. I know a lot of these multipliers. I know a lot of these diminishers. I then run into them in the airport, so to speak. And they're like, oh, this is such a great idea. I'm such a multiplier. I'm like, wow, that's not what the person who worked for you said. Like, and I had heard people talk about these like deeply diminishing effects. In fact, when I'm asking people to identify a diminisher, they're picking the most diminishing manager that they've had in their entire career. And there were cases where that person, I run into them onto the street and they're like, oh yeah, I love this multipliers idea. I'm such a multiplier. I'm like, how is that possible? And that's when I started to see it. And I think I started to see it like in myself as well. Like, oh yeah, I can now see my own diminishing effect. But yet I was trying so hard to do that right. I was trying to be helpful. You know, I was trying to be supportive. I was trying to be encouraging. I was trying to to do well. And I ended up, you know, suffocating someone. I've been thinking a lot about this book. And this talking to you is just going to make me stay up all night thinking about all this. In in a good way, though. Don't In, in a good way. Um, so uh, another thing I wanted to talk about um, before we jump into some of the actual behaviors was was around the mindset of a diminisher um, versus a multiplier, and and I I think this this can tie in nicely with with the whole idea of, of paradigms, where with with a paradigm, you know, a, a paradigm is like a like a mental model, the way that you see the world, and based on the way you see things and understand things, as far as you know, perception and understanding, it affects your attitude and your behavior naturally. And so I found it very um, interesting that the, the different mindsets that they both have when it, when it comes to viewing intelligence in other people. I, I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about, about that difference in mindset. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. And I really didn't realize it at the time, but it is a very different paradigm for thinking about leadership. And I think I first saw this in something that it was strangely Jeffrey Bezos had said in reaction to the book. And um, he had taken a look at um, someone who worked for him had been involved in the research and they were asking Jeff if he would review the book and he did. And, and his reaction was something that struck me. He said, Oh, this is interesting. No one's ever looked at intelligence through the lens of, I'm sorry. No one's ever looked at leadership through the lens of intelligence. It's like, oh yeah, I guess that is a very different, it's a very different paradigm for looking at leadership. And, and sort of the old paradigm 
we, we saw was like the behavior of, you know, we're looking for traits of, of leaders. And what this is really asking is how does the mental model that a leader holds about intelligence, how does that affect the capability levels and intelligence of people who work for them? And, you know, it, it's this kind of very new paradigm for leadership is, is to move beyond this idea that it's the leader's intelligence that defines the capability of the team, you know, how visionary they are, how compelling they are, how charismatic, like the, the, the capability of the team is a function of the leader's intelligence to this new idea that actually the way that the leader uses, uses the intelligence of others is what determines the capability of the entire team. And it, and it's looking at this this mindset in an interesting way. Another interesting for early, early reaction, it was before the book came out, came from Carol Dweck. And I imagine you are familiar with her work. Most of us are familiar with her work. I had asked her to review an early copy of the book. And, and she did. And she was like ebullient. I went to meet with her. She was sort of ebullient. And I couldn't figure out why she was so excited about this. And, and then she, she told me, she's like, it's like you took the concept of mindset and applied it into the business world and into a setting. So mindset is, is how we see our own intelligence and capability. You know, with a, a growth mindset, we have this belief that, you know what, I, I can learn, I can figure it out with the right kind of teaching and coaching. Like I can figure out how to do hard things. My intelligence can grow. Whereas, of course, the fixed mindset says, you know, I've got like a limited amount. That's all there is. What multipliers does is is considers what happens when the leader holds a fixed or a growth mindset about the people they lead. So, you know, if I work for you, you've got your own view of your own like intelligence. Like, are you capable of learning and growing and figuring it out? But you also hold an assumption about me. Like, what do I think of Liz? Is Liz smart? And do I see that as well? She's smart or not? Or do I see it as, you know what? Liz is smart and is going to figure this out. Like she's capable of learning and growing. And if I give her enough safety that she feels comfortable taking on a challenge, but enough stretch that she has to learn, like that she'll actually perform at their best. So I think that at the very core what multiplier leaders have is they have a growth mindset about others. Now I never started with that kind of lens in mind, but I think it's, it's probably what's going on at its essence. You know, the diminisher tends to hold this belief that people aren't going to figure it out without me. Like people need my smarts, my intelligence, my capability for them to figure it out. Whereas the multiplier holds this belief that, you know, fundamentally people are pretty smart and they're going to figure it out. Now, they might make some mistakes along the way. They might not get it perfect. They might need to iterate this. They probably need good direction. They probably need good coaching, but they're capable of figuring out. And in some ways, it's as simple as that. I, I was struck when I when I reread this again, just how how powerful that that mindset, it just, it influences everything. And when you, when you get into the five disciplines of multipliers, um, I just kind of kept coming, coming back to that as like, it, it starts with the mindset. It starts with the paradigm, um, that the, the behavior flows from the way that they view people. And it, and it made me kind of reflect internally and say, do I, do I do that? And then I, then I went down this path of saying, am I a multiplier diminisher? And then I found, and I don't know if this is uh, something you've seen uh, with others, but I feel like in some instances, I am a multiplier. And then, but if I'm being honest with myself, that other times, you know, in other relationships and scenarios, I'm I can be a I can be a diminisher. Is is that a common is that is that a common thing that that happens when when people <laughs> reflect on it? Yeah. Yeah. Let me give you two data points. Um, one was. Uh when I was doing the research and I was doing interviews at Apple and I'm down there, let's say on a Wednesday and I'm talking to someone and they tell me about this like adject diminisher. And, you know, I get the whole profile and all the data 
And then I go there, I think it was literally the next day. And I talked to someone else in that same division and I asked him to name sort of a multiplier or a diminisher. And he picks as his multiplier, that very same guy who was a total diminisher to someone else. Now, if something's going to give a researcher an identity crisis, like this is it, I'm like, what? How is that possible? Because I had just like built this diminisher profile on this one person, but yet he's a multiplier to someone else. Well, that's interesting. What's going on there? And, and then later after the book comes out, um, I got called in to meet with um, a CEO and she said, Liz, I read your book and I have a question for you. I'm like, okay. And she goes, I want to know, is it possible that I could be a total multiplier to 80% of my team and an abject diminisher to the other 20? Yes, I think so. And, and, you know, when I first started this, this is like confessions of a social science researcher. I'm going to air all my dirty laundry here with you, um, Stephen. Is when I started, I was seeing, I mean, a bit of this spectrum, but I thought that there were multipliers and diminishers because people could so easily name them. I could see them. But what I came to realize is there are situations that it's far more situational, that there are situations where we end up having very much a multiplier effect, but then there are situations that probably bait what I believe is probably like an, a diminishing streak that lurks in all of us. Like I know some people who are just total multipliers, like they've probably never had a diminishing thought in their whole life. Everyone loves working for them. Everyone's at their best around them. But most of us have a little bit of both in us. And there are certain situations that tend to bring out our inner diminisher the end of quarter if you're in sales might be one of them you know it might be stressful situations you know we tend to jump in and micromanage and tell people what to do it could be um also certain people that could end up like and it really comes back to what are the assumptions that we have about those people like why am i such a multiplier to one but a diminisher to the other. What are the assumptions that I'm holding? And I could be even behaving the exact same way around both. But my assumptions about them and their capability and the outcome, they're different. And, you know, I'll tell you one other thing that was really funny in this research. And I think it really, it speaks to the power of paradigm. Is I was asking people to describe the behavior of these different kinds of leaders and also to describe their mindset. Like what did they believe to be true? What's their assumption? I went into this assuming that people would rattle off the behavior, but struggle to identify the mindset because like how, how do you possibly know what somebody else is thinking? And so I thought people were going to look at me like, that's a dumb question. Why are you even asking me that? Go ask them. And what I found was it was exactly the opposite that people struggle to remember the behavior, like, oh yeah, what did they do? But when I asked, what did this leader believe to be true? That they could rattle that off. And what I realized is it's kind of like this realization that you've been going through your life as a leader, as a leader with your underwear on the inside, on the outside. And people like are seeing this because we think that these are all just assumptions we hold in our head, like, oh, you know what, Fred? He's going to let me down. I've been through this before. Like Fred's going to screw this up. I just know he's going to screw it up. I'm giving him this work. I'm going to try to do the right thing, but you know, he's going to screw this up. Like I've always thought those were quiet thoughts I had in my head. And what I realized is that people know what we're thinking. Like they know if we're assuming that they're going to hit this thing out of the park or strike out that our assumptions in some ways speak louder than our behavior. Isn't that strange? Yeah, it's, it's strange, but it also makes a lot of sense too, um, to, to me, uh, because of, because again, of the way that you're seeing someone reflects that, that that's how your attitude and behavior naturally flow from that. But we can tell if, you know, and, and, you know, to reference, um, I want to pull trust into here. 
not just because of your relationship with the author, uh, but whether we trust someone or not is not a secret we keep in our head. I think people can tell, like we can feel when we've been, when we're being trusted and we can feel when someone is suspicious that we are not going to get it done, not capable. I was at a dinner party with, um, it was like some family gathering and I overheard my mother who had done all the copy editing for the first draft of, of Multiplies. I didn't realize the publisher actually does that for you. I kind of thought I had to turn in like a finished book. So they said they'd never seen a manuscript like so clean ever in like the history of books. My mom had read every word, you know, edited. It was all like uh, grammatically correct. And, and I overheard her say, you know, if I could sum up Elizabeth's book in one word, it would be trust. I was like, that's really interesting. Trust. See, what happens when we trust the intelligence and capability of the people we work with? We give them hard things to do. We give them space. You know, we, we're not afraid of debating the issues. We, you know, we, we, we hold back. We play fewer chips. We let them play more. But like, what happens when we're not trusting the capability of those around us? We are just pulled down that diminishing path. So I think it really does come down to trust. Yeah, no, that's, yeah, it's, it's a lot, a lot to think of. So yeah, in, in summarizing the book, I, I really like how you said your, your mom says it's one word is trust. And then you were also saying safety and, and stretch if you had to like combine it all. I, I kind of like that almost three, three pillars of the book, right? The safety stretch. Tr well, I, I guess, tr I guess trust encompasses the safety aspect and the stretch part of it as, as well. I guess when you think about it. Well, you know, that's funny because I was just going to say that, but you beat me to it. Like oh. <laughs> you put that together is yeah. Like safety is about creating an environment of trust and you can't stretch people without trust in it. Like, yeah, it's kind of two, two sides to that. And, you know, it really is this mindset that people are smart and can figure it out. Now, it's got this, I don't want to make it sound naive and Pollyanna-ish. It's not like, oh, everyone in the world is a genius. I actually think we have lots of evidence that not everyone in the world is yeah. a genius. <laughs> Whether it's the Darwin War, some of what we see in like politics and the circus around us, it's this assumption that everyone has genius yeah there might be some people who like were at the front of the line when intelligence was being passed out like there are some true geniuses but everyone has intelligence that they bring to a team or to a challenge or to an organization and it might come at various levels but it also exists in technical like everyone has their own form of genius like what I'm smart at is different than what you're smart at, that's different than what Fred is smart at. And, and it's seeing that with the right kind of leadership, with trust, with an environment where people feel both comfortable and challenged to the safety and stretch, that that intelligence that each person brings, it can be used and it can be grown. So in some ways, it's like the mindset is not seeing talent as some... Um, horizon or some threshold it's seeing intelligence and talent more like um, a skyline where it exists at different levels and it exists in different forms and your job as a leader is to get access to it and to grow it like you know what rather than bemoan oh i wish everyone was as smart as you know jennifer it's how do i help everybody level up how do i have help everyone add a floor to their capability yeah. And what, and what you just said, and I was going to mention this, that for me personally was one of my biggest takeaways is I've, you know, I've got a few people that I've worked with in the past that in my mind I had labeled, and, and I, I don't think I came to this realization until I just read the book recently, that I had labeled as in my mind, maybe not as intelligent and, and I'll just freely admit that. Um, but after reading this book, I realized to say, no, it, if, if you really want to be a multiplier, just what you said, you can look at, look at everyone and say, no, they 
they have something to offer. They have something great to offer and they are very intelligent and it may not be in this this task they were assigned at some previous date where I where I originally labeled them. It's it's something else and that and that to me it's like, wow, okay, that's that's a multiplier. It's the one that can you know, see and perceive and and understand their people and say, no, you're, you are smart when it comes to this. I'm going to get, I'm going to get it out of you. You're smart at something. And, you know, I think being a parent of a, I guess a fairly large brood, I've got four kids. Like one thing's like, in some ways you get the law of large numbers once you get a large brood. And one of the things you realize once you get past two of these human beings that you've been entrusted with is, they're so different. And instead of comparing them to each other, it's just like, who is this person? And what are they brilliant at? What does their mind do? And it has helped me a lot as a, a leader in the in the work world is being able to see that we all come in very different sort of sizes and shapes when it comes to our minds. And um, I love the way um, someone put it to me. They said, man, I read the book and I'm just... They're like one takeaway was instead of asking, is someone smart? Like, cause we all ask that in our head. I've asked that and I've come to the conclusion at times. I'm like, oh, that person's not smart. And it's backing away from that logic and, and asking a different question, which I think is a very powerful question is in what way is this person smart? So it's in some ways, you know, multiplier comes down to two really powerful beliefs. One is this assumption that people are smart and that there is a way that they are smart and I've got to find it and use it. That's one. And and the second is this kind of this assumption that people want to be smart and they want to contribute. And, you know, it's funny, I've been studying leadership for, you know, quite a while now. And you know, some people consider me an expert on leadership. And I'm like, oh, that's not really what I'm an expert about. In some ways, what I've become really, really um, like deeply immersed in and, and understand is contributorship. And I think by studying the best leaders and some of the worst leaders, what I've learned is that people come to work every day wanting to contribute everything that they have. Like, I can't seem to find these lazy employees. Like you hear managers like, oh, I had to do it for them because they didn't want to do it or they couldn't do it. Or, you know, no one on my team steps up. But then I go and I talk to the team and I get such a very different story. And I'm not saying that everyone comes to work every day and contributes at their fullest. They most certainly do not. But people want to. And if they get to the point where they no longer want to, it's a learned and tragic conclusion. You know, what I've learned is that people want to come to work and they want to contribute. They want to share their ideas. They want to share their capability. They want to share it generously and freely. And what happens is when they get into an environment where they have this overtly diminishing boss, like, okay, no, you have to play small so I can play big. Or someone who's just so consumed with their own capability, they can't see beyond them or someone who's trying so hard to be helpful, but is actually suffocating his team. It's actually painful for them when they can't show up big and it's exhausting. It's frustrating. And, you know, I think that's part of like this multiplier logic is assuming people are capable, but also assuming people desperately want to contribute. They want to impress you. They don't want to disappoint you. And when people are showing signs that they want to, like something's gone wrong for them. Like someone's taught them to do this. But yeah, no, it's like, I don't know. I I, I think what I've learned in all of this has a lot to do with just kind of human nature. And it's like, I feel like I've learned people want to contribute at a hundred percent and, and they want to have an impact and they like we're wired for contribution and we're wired for impact and we're wired for growth. Like, I don't know. I don't know where it comes from. Yeah. You, you articulated 
kind of some of my my takeaways um, from this where I really have questioned some of my assumptions, the way that I, I see people. So it's been great. Well, I, I know um, from a from a time standpoint, there's a couple questions I like to end um, every every podcast with. Uh, so the first one is what what is one practical action step a listener could take to be more of a multiplier in in his or her life? Oh, can I have two or three? I'm not good with one. Yes, you can. You can have multiple. For 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 you, Liz. So one, yes. <laughs> being generous with me. I think for starters, I would just reiterate this. Like if we want to get ourselves into the multiplier mindset, it's like maybe the one thing that you do is simply ask, in what way is this person smart? Like it usually helps me reset and get out of my diminishing logic and back to center. Um, that tends to be powerful. Uh, if someone wants to, you know, operate and practice like a multiplier, probably the one of the core practices would be to just ask more questions, to tell less and to ask more often, ask more questions, ask more interesting questions, um, have ready questions. Like one of uh, a practice that I think is, is helpful is to have a set of back pocket questions. I think every leader should have a set a, of go-to questions. Now in my ideal world, leaders are very thoughtful going into meetings like, okay, what impact do I want to have on the team? What can I do to create an environment where people like can go big and take on? What questions do I need to ask? A lot of people don't have time for that. So have a set of back pocket questions, meaning four or five go-to questions that you can ask anytime, anywhere to get good thinking going. It could be as simple as what's your perspective on this? Or even the simpler version of that, of what do you think? Uh, or some of my favorites are, what am I not understanding that's important to understand? Or what risks or downsides have we not talked about? Like, what reservations do you have about moving forward? Like, there are some generic questions that will just get us into question asking mode. Um, and then I guess if I had one plea for managers beyond that, it would be just to hold back more. You know, a lot of times when I've been called in to coach leaders, I, I, it's a shared problem is that they're working too hard. They're trying to do too much of it themselves. Like um, I wrote a little article about uh, Dave Havlick at, at Salesforce about this liberating effect he had on his team. I was writing it for Harvard Business Review and I was asking him to review it prior to publication. And he said, Liz, you know, like it's mostly right, but not entirely right because you described this liberating effect it had on my team when I started to operate more like a multiplier. And he said, what you missed was the liberating effect it had on me. Like I, I used to give everyone answers. I had to tell what to do. Like I, I was this like, hub that everything had to go through. And he said, when I started asking questions and giving other people more ownership, like I didn't have to work as hard. And like, I think most managers are trying to do too much themselves. Like take that burden of having answers and getting it done and just share that sweet burden with your team. Like it's actually an easier way of working. I like it. Do you have more than that? Because I could, I could keep listening. <laughs> Don't get me going. Um, <laughs> no, I just can't know that. My accidentally diminishing tendencies is I'm an idea fountain, and so we'll just we'll leave it at that. That's that's okay. No, that's that that's awesome. Let, so, last question is, and I, I ask this to everyone that I have because it's, it's it's a question uh, that's meaningful to me, and I feel like it's meaningful kind of to the world right now is, is this idea around success. So the way I phrase it is pretend that you were sitting one-on-one -on -one with someone who was just starting out in their career and they asked you about success, both what is success and how to be successful. How would you go about answering that question? Well, there's different paths to success and, you know, depending on which path you go down, it will take you to a very different form of success. And 
I think what I would ask would be like, what do you want to do with your talent, with your intelligence, with your know-how? And, you know, there is the path of the, the genius, meaning I'm going to optimize my career around my capability, my presence, my ability to solve problems, my ability to give a compelling presentation. And that can be a path to success. Absolutely. And it can take you down the path of the diminisher, but there are very successful diminishers. I, mean, I could name a bunch. I bet anyone listening could name a bunch. But I would say, is that the success you want? Because there is another path to a different kind of success. And that's the path of the genius maker. Like, what do you want to do with your talent? Is it there for your success? Or will you use it to create success around you? You know, you mentioned the story about Magic Johnson. I was so struck with this when, you know, he's he's a superstar, he's a high school player. He's like killing it. You know, they win every game. He's a star. They win with 54 points. He scored 50 of them. He's getting all of this praise, reinforcement, kudos from the team, the coach. And then after one particular game, he looks at the faces of the parents of these high school kids who came to watch their kid play. And they got to watch like this early version of like Laker Showtime Magic. And, and it like, got into him and and he decides he's a high school kid who decides that he said I made a decision that I would use my god-given talent to help everyone on the team be a better player it's like what do you want to do with your talent are you going to use it to play big or are you going to use it so that everyone around you can play big as well and why I think magic really exemplifies this is it's not like he said oh golly shucks like let me always be the passer. You know, I'm going to just do the assist. I'm going to stand on the sidelines and cheer on the team. Like he plays huge. He gives everything he's got, but he does it in a way that invites at minimum allows, but if not invites or dares other people to play big around him, these are very different forms of leadership and they're very different kinds of success. And you know, some people will take the path of, I want to be the superstar. I want to be the genius. I want to be the hero. I want to solve problems, have answers, but it's not the only form of success. And, you know, I guess what I know studying these kinds of leaders is they get more from other people. They benefit from that as well, but, you know, and there's an economic argument to getting more from the people around you. But I think in the end, it just comes down to I don't know, legacy? Like, how do you want to be remembered? Like, it's nice to be kind of like remembered, you know, whether someone worked for you most of the company, you just remember it's like, oh yeah, like my boss was smart. Or do you want to be remembered as the person who like, man, I was at my best around them. Yeah, they were brilliant, but I was brilliant too. Like, pick your path. But they're very different paths. I'm almost literally speechless by um, just kind of how mind blowing this conversation has been, Liz. I uh, really excited for people to listen to this. This has been an honor to have you on the podcast. Um, this conversation has truly impacted me personally, and I know it will impact a lot of others. So thank you so much, Liz, for, for being with us. I was going to thank you and thank you for just like the generosity with which you're sharing like these ideas and books that have meaning for you and I think can have meaning for others. You know, we are in a world that is um, peddling success strategies that probably are a little bit more like junk food than nutrition. And it's easy. I get deceived all the time. And so it's nice to have a place to come back to like Thank you. Thanks, Liz.